Hello, ladies. I hope everyone's having a great first half of the week. And let's see, let me make sure everything is working here. Okay. All right, I think we're good. We are here today to talk about, uh, the topic was um, five questions that you should ask yourself if you are struggling to lose weight. And obviously this is a topic um, that is very popular. <laughs> uh, you see lots and lots and lots of um, people always talking about how they're working so hard to lose weight and just can't seem to make progress, things like that. So um, I figured this would be a good one just to give some things to think about. Obviously, there is far more than five things to be thinking about or considering when uh, when they're looking to start losing weight or continue losing weight. However, these are, I chose five things that um, uh, maybe don't get considered as often. I feel like everybody talks about the obvious things like calories and, and food quality and things like that. So I tried to choose five things that maybe are not considered quite as often and then we'll explain why for each of them. Um, as I was typing this one up, it just kind of kept going and going and going. So I'm, I'm concerned that this actually may be a fairly long live. So I don't want to waste any more time. I just want to get in it. Um, so um, we know millions of people are struggling to lose weight at any given time. Like I said, this is something we see all the time. It is not new. Um, this is why the media is always so full of stories where they're always talking about weight loss and giving every new fad diet in the book as the next magic bullet to lose weight, um, they get clicks, right? Because so many people are struggling to lose weight. And so that's, that's what it's about. It's about the clicks. It's about the advertising and it works. So um, these are my, like I said a minute ago, top five things that, um, that I want you to think about or people should be thinking about when they're starting to try to lose weight. And these are not the top five most obvious things. So there are certainly things that are arguably maybe more important, such as how many calories you're eating. Um, however, that's a really obvious one that I did not want to waste your time with. So let's get to it. Question number one that you should ask yourself is, how is my sleep? Sleep is incredibly important, not only to our just overall wellness, but also to weight loss. Um, there are so many things that happen while we are sleeping. It, your brain is organized on organizing all of your memories, um, storing your short-term memory, things like that. Um, this is when our body facilitates the recovery after the workouts. I tell people all the time that your workouts are not as important as your recovery. Your recovery is where the magic happens. If we are working out too often and not allowing for recovery, or if our sleep quality slash quantity isn't great and we're not getting proper recovery, you're not going to see the results that you want to see. It's very plain and simple. Um, also, when we're sleeping, that's when our cortisol levels drop. So remember, cortisol is our stress hormone. Um, and then there's other hormones that flood our system and rebalance and, and all of the things that take place during our sleep and at different stages in our sleep too. So that's why sleep quality is just as important as sleep quantity. We wanna make sure that we're getting adequate amounts of deep sleep and REM sleep, not just the light sleep, which is usually takes up the majority of our sleep. Um, when we don't get enough sleep, our cortisol doesn't stay lowered long enough in order to turn off the fight or flight part of our nervous system in order to relax. And then what happens is when we don't ever have that opportunity for an extended amount of time for that part of our nervous system to, to downregulate or to relax, it kind of can get stuck in this chronic state and we may not even realize it. And I'm gonna talk more on that in a minute. Um, and, and why this is a big deal is in cortisol, high chronic levels of cortisol are a very common uh, purpose, what's the word I want? A very common um, reason for belly fat. Looking to lose weight, you don't want belly fat, obviously. Um, and then also, when we're not sleeping enough, it bumps up. We have a hunger hormone. There's actual hormones in our body that help us um, indicate whether or not we're hungry, and it also helps dictate some of our cravings. So ghrelin is one of those hormones, and when we don't sleep enough, those hormones rise, making you think that you are hungry when you've actually eaten plenty 
to where you should be satisfied. However, you're not because those hormones are sending that signal to your brain, I need more food, I need more food. So not getting enough sleep can make a really big impact on the amount of calories that you end up ultimately eating in a day. And not to mention, when we don't get enough sleep, what are the things that we crave? Caffeine, sugar, right? All the things that we think give us energy, we start over consuming these things in an attempt to seek out an artificial form of energy because we didn't get enough sleep. And then what does that obviously lead to overeating excessive calories? So um, we want to be super, super aware and be very, very honest with yourself about your sleep quality and your sleep quantity. So how much sleep you're getting and is it good, true quality sleep? Um, if you are struggling with sleep, we did a live several weeks ago, maybe even several months ago, actually, on sleep. So go ahead to the events tab at the top of the group, and you should be able to see all of the lives that we've done if you scroll through that. Um, so question number two, for real, for real, for real, how is your stress? One of the things that we um, find in people who uh, regularly live in a high stressed state, whether it's a stressful job, um, stressful family situations, or excessive high intensity exercise, like the HIIT classes that a lot of people do, what we find with those people is that they think that they are handling stress very well. They think that they're not stressed. But really what it is, they are incredibly stressed. Their bodies are indicating incredible amounts of stress, but that's their normal. High stress is what's normal for them, so they don't really realize that they are actually stressed out. So that's why I started with this for real, for real. How is your stress? Don't just think, oh no, I feel fine. Really stop and analyze it for a minute because so many of us are so highly stressed that when we're not overstressed, we think everything's fine, but it's not fine usually, guys, girls, ladies, it's not fine. Um, so you just simply don't recognize it because you've it's become your version of normal when it's really not normal for a human body to endure so much stress. So what happens is we don't often implement strategies to cope with stress because we think that we're not stressed. So why does stress matter with weight loss? Here we go again, cortisol. Cortisol is your stress hormone that I just talked about during sleep, and it comes up so often in a lot of these lives that we do. Chronically high cortisol causes belly fat. So allowing yourself to get super, super honest about your current stress levels will allow you the opportunity to include stress management techniques into your daily life and begin to manage that stress to begin to lower your cortisol levels and then everything else gets balanced over time. Cortisol is a hormone. If cortisol is elevated, then things aren't balanced, right? You have a hormone that's too high, therefore your hormones are not balanced. So you've got to be able to regulate it and bring it down at appropriate times, like before eating, like before bed, in order to have these things balanced. Now, cortisol naturally goes through waves during the day. So at night, around eight to 10 o'clock, cortisol levels start to drop so that you can sleep. It is at its lowest while you're sleeping. And then in the morning, around six-ish to eight-ish a.m., cortisol levels rise again to get us ready for the day. Um, so it is natural for cortisol to go through um, waves, I guess. Um, however, an, in a lot of people, it doesn't often have this down part as down as it should be, and that's where we have issues. So some strategies that you can do to control stress. A lot of things that might include, um, obviously, getting better sleep, so looking at your sleep hygiene to make sure that you're improving your quantity and quality of sleep. Um, taking walks in nature has been proven to lower stress, doing yoga, listening to classical music, um, it, particularly yoga and things if it's part of like a morning routine or a bedtime routine, it helps set mindset. Um, bedtime routine helps prepare and uh, helps to lower that cortisol so that you can get better quantity and quality sleep. Um, and then also you have other things you can do like deep breathing, 
Um, and then supplementation of things like ashwagandha, which is an adaptogen that helps to lower cortisol. Um, bedtime, you could take magnesium glycinate that will help you get better quality sleep because it also helps lower cortisol. Um, so there are many, many different things that you can do. You need to find what works for you. Okay, question number three. I'm trying to go quickly. Hopefully I'm not going too fast. If y'all have any questions or anything, feel free to put them in the comments. All right, number three may seem like an obvious one, like how many calories are you eating? However, <clears throat> this is an important one that sometimes we pretend like it's maybe not as big of an issue as it is. The question is, am I moving enough? I know it sounds obvious, but a whole lot of people out there are still saying, no, I am not moving enough, or we don't want to admit that it's no, I'm not moving enough. So we know that we need to move. Everyone acknowledges that movement is important, but very few of us actually do it. We say it's important. We say, oh, I need to do that more, yet we still stay on the couch. If you are a couch potato, you don't need to go zero to 100. You do not need to suddenly, out of nowhere, decide that you want to become a bodybuilder. It's completely unnecessary. However, if you want to, go for it. But just any amount of ed adding in movement is going to be a benefit to you. <clears throat> so start slow, get a step counter if you don't have one, like Fitbit or an Apple Watch or um, a Garmin. There's many other, lots of brands that you can get. Uh, it, just to pay attention to your movement. I think a lot of people would be aw awfully shocked by how few steps they actually get in a day once we start checking in. Um, I was a teacher and I fully expected that I got well over 10,000 steps a day. I was real surprised when I was only hitting about 6,000. Turns out I stood around my classroom a lot. Didn't actually walk around my classroom. I never sat down, but I did not often move. So, um, so I was truly shocked when I got that. I thought I never sit. How could my steps be so low? Well, it's because I just stood instead of sitting. So a lot of people would be truly surprised, but go ahead and get some kind of a step tracker. It doesn't need to be expensive. You could even keep your phone in your pocket as long as you remember to keep it in your pocket. I'm bad, I set it on my desk, I set it places and then wander around and so that never worked for me. But if you remember to keep it in your pocket, that can work for you. So once you get a step counter and do just walk around for normal life for about a week or so and see where your natural uh, step number is hitting and then set yourself some goals. So you don't need to go, if you're normally hitting about 4,000 steps, you don't need to try to jump to 10,000 right away. You can, if you can do it, fantastic, do it. However, if that feels overwhelming to you, that's okay, you don't have to do that. Maybe just add one or 2,000 to whatever your average is and work on hitting that every single day. So like, if your average is 4,000, work on getting five or 6,000 for about a week, maybe two weeks even. And then once you've made that a consistent habit, now, okay, let's bump it to 6,000. You know, slowly, incrementally go up. You don't have to go zero to 100. Um, you might want to um, just look at other things that you're doing too, like simple things, parking at the back of the parking lot instead of waiting forever for someone to pull out of the closest one. <laughs> I see this happen all of the time. People will wait forever for somebody to park out of a nearby spot when there's like four spots right down the line that they could have gone to and been in the store by the time they actually park their car. Walk, go ahead and get some movement. Um, you know, stairs instead of elevators. We hear that kind of thing all the time. Even going outside, play with the kids, play with the dogs. Um, stand up and stretch uh, during the workday. Set a timer for um, every 30 minutes or every 45 minutes to stand up, stretch, and do a lap around your floor if you work in an office or, um, you know, I work from home. So <laughs> I will go outside and I'll do a lap around the backyard and I'll come back in. Um, so there's lots of different things that you can do to try to increase your steps. It doesn't have to be a very deliberate, let's go out and take a walk. It can be. And remember the stress thing we talked about a minute ago? Going out and walking in nature can help reduce stress too. So you can get your steps and you can reduce your stress all at the same time. Um, so let's see here. Let me check my notes. Um, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't forget that this week, our theme for the week, our hashtag for the week is hashtag steps. And since we're talking about getting more steps, this is a great time. Make sure you're posting in the group using hashtag steps. Um, you can share ideas, you can share your step goals, you can share if you've met your step goals, you can share whatever you'd like to share if it has to do with getting in some steps. Um, so other ideas besides walking, how you can get some movement, extra movement in during the day. Let's see. Um, oh, keep a set of resistance bands next to your TV 
And if you tend to sit and watch TV shows in the evening, just have those resistance band there. Do some pull aparts, um, you know, whatever. You can do like the ones that go around your legs. You can do like legs out, kicks, whatever. There's things that you can do just sitting there that will help increase movement. And also since resistance bands are resistance, you know, build a little bit of muscle too while you're at it. Um, I also used to like keeping, uh, you know, those smaller loop bands, like the booty bands, I would keep those at my desk here and I would put it on while I'm working and I would just put it right up above my knee and just work on like doing the adductors, the, the legs out. Um, so people used to call those good girls, bad girls, you know, the legs out, it's the bad girls. Anyway, um, <laughs> I digress. Um, but <laughs> with the, the knees out, um, the knees out exercise with booty bands just while you're sitting there working. You can do that. A lot of people, if you tend to be a fidgeter, a good one that a lot of people like is to put that resistance band around your ankles and just kick one of your legs a little bit up against it. And that sometimes helps a lot of people who like to fidget. It helps them think or things like that. Um, so, but adding that little bit of resistance in now makes it a little more challenging, helps build a little more muscle, gets a little more movement in, which burns a little more calories. You see where we're going with this. Um, I mentioned already like setting an alarm for about every 30 minutes to take a walk. Maybe you give yourself two minutes to get up, maybe do some stretches, run in place a little bit, take a walk around your, your, uh, your floor or something. If you work in an office, walking down the hall to the restroom, whatever. Um, just making sure that you're giving yourself breaks throughout the day to stand up and not stay in the seated position all day long. All right. Question number four. Whoo, we're almost there. Question number four is something that does not get considered a lot until it's, uh, it needs to be considered. And the question is, could your body be inflamed? So inflammation is not a very common consideration. However, it, it is an extremely common um, thing. I'm at a loss for words today. Oh, I've had a rough week. It's an extremely common condition. That's what I'm looking for. A common condition and for those who eat a standard American diet. However, it is not often considered very often until, like I said, it needs to be considered. So you may not always necessarily see inflammation. However, a lot of you can feel it. And this is what I mean by it's not a consideration a lot of times until it needs to be. If you have pain in your joints on the regular, you probably are experiencing inflammation. Um, if you oftentimes feel like you're walking around in a fog, another sign of inflammation. Uh, digestive issues. Um, if you get sick regularly, like your immune system just isn't quite up to par, if your blood pressure is a little bit on the high side, all of these things are indications of inflammation. And you can see how, like I said, a lot of these things we don't pay attention to until we need to. Blood pressure gets up too high, pain gets too much, you get tired of walking around in a fog or you want the digestive issues um, addressed. So all of these things are signs of inflammation. And like I said, inflammation is super common in the American diet. So what do you do about it? Highly processed foods are shown to increase inflammation. So what are processed foods? All foods are pretty much processed, right? Unless you're literally going to the farm. So highly processed foods. So we're talking about foods that have been um, on a high level changed from their natural form. So for example, I happen to love chicken nuggets. I own it, I admit it, I just had them for lunch an hour ago. <laughs> I love chicken nuggets. So chicken nuggets obviously aren't natural. Chickens don't just come as nuggets, right? So they're cut up, they're breaded, whatever, we bake them, not fry them. But, um, but a chicken nugget is very much less, even though it is processed, it's much less processed than some other type of food that you might eat that might include all kinds of ingredients that you can't really pronounce terribly well. So like take, I don't even know my brain, like potato chips, eh, potato chips, Cheetos. What the heck is even Cheetos? Corn, I guess, Cheetos or corn, I think. Um, but you can, you see where I'm going. Things that are processed far and well beyond what they actually were in nature those kinds of things are shown to have a very high um, instance of causing inflammation in average people. So we want to try to opt for whole foods whenever possible, or at least minimally processed foods. So, um, you know, if you're going to eat, my brain simply doesn't work. Do you have any examples that you can put in the comments of, of different choices of whole food versus a processed food? So 
Um, lots of things are processed. Cereals, crackers, things that we eat all the time are processed. And I am absolutely not going to sit here and tell you do not eat processed foods because y'all, that's just not realistic. However, um, minimizing it or limiting some of the exceedingly processed things is not a terrible plan. Things like candy, things like chips, and stuff like that. Um, the fake cheeses that goes in mac and cheese, oh, it's delicious, but what, what even is that? Um, so eating anti-inflammatory foods such as fatty fish, like salmon, or taking a fish oil sub supplement can help you reduce inflammation as well. Uh, fish oil is one of those things that is on my highly recommended list for my own personal uh, training clients. Fish oil is great not only for our brain health, but the inflammation, um, the anti-inflammation properties that it has. If you eat fatty fish at least two times a week, you probably don't need a fish oil. If you don't eat fatty fish at least two times a week, then I do recommend getting a good fish oil. Legion Athletics has a great one if you need it. Uh, granite supplements also is another good one. Um, so food intolerances can also cause inflammation, particularly gluten and dairy. Um, I would not recommend eliminating gluten or dairy unless medically necessary. It does not affect everybody the same. Um, so please don't run out and say that I said you should cut out gluten and dairy. I did not. I'm just saying that it is likely um, that if your body does not process those two things very well, those can also be highly inflammatory. Um, so no surprise, but getting more sleep, controlling your stress, and regular movement, numbers one, two, and three that we just talked about, those are also great strategies to reduce inflammation in our body. Being chronically inflamed increases, all together now, cortisol, and then we have looped ourselves right back into this pattern again. So all of the things so far that we're talking about are all things that increase our cor hormone cortisol, which throws our hormones off balance, which then leads us to belly fat. Um, also, keep in mind, drinking alcohol is very highly inflammatory. Um, and so limiting alcohol is great. Um, and so you're seeing this pattern where we need to keep our cortisol in check, right? Because if our body is handling cortisol, our body is not handling things like losing fat. If our body is trying to control our inflammation, our body is not able to handle things like losing fat. So all of these things play a super critically important part into our overall um, weight loss goals. And then finally, I feel like I've been here forever. How long have I been here? Ah, 22 minutes. Okay, let's wrap it up. So finally, last one, am I setting realistic goals around my weight loss? This one is huge because so many people expect these gigantic drops in weight immediately when they begin working to lose weight. When they only see small changes, which are realistic, they feel discouraged, they give up, they stop the whole thing, and then they're right back to where they started, oftentimes gaining even more back than what they just lost. So realistic and sustainable weight loss goals for most people are anywhere from a half a pound to two pounds a week. It is always dependent upon how much you have to lose, um, how much is more realistic. However, a loss is a loss right? It does it, I mean, it to, on some degree, on some level, yes, it matters how much the loss is, but we can't give up. We have to be realistic. We have to be patient with yourself. You didn't gain all of that weight in a week. You can't expect to lose it all in a week. So um, if you are considered obese, two to two and a half pounds a week would be considered um, sustainable and healthy, maybe even three, depending. Um, however, when we lose weight quickly, we are also setting ourselves up to gain it back very quickly. Um, my goal with my clients is always, always, always eating as much as we can eat while still seeing progress. When we do these crash diets that you see, um, Octavia, I'm talking to you. Yeah, people do lose a lot of weight, 100%. They absolutely do. But then you know what else? When they start eating real food and not those nasty bars and they haven't been taught any skills how to eat properly, then they gain it all back and then they gain back more. So we don't ever want to fall into the trap of the fad quick fix diet. We want healthy, sustainable, consistent weight loss is always the goal. Um, another realistic expectation to understand is that the scale will not always move every single week. It is incredibly normal and it's to be expected. When you go into weight loss expecting that, you're not gonna be as frustrated when it doesn't happen. 
So things like taking measurements, taking progress photos are super important because when the scale doesn't move, those other things are usually pretty telling. Um, also remember that if you lift weights, if you are building muscle, the scale is not going to move as much as you expect it to because like I just said, you're building muscle. So you may not be losing as much on the scale because remember the scale is literally just how your body relates to gravity. It has nothing to do with the amount of muscle, fat, whatever, blood, water in your body. So keep that in mind always, always. And then I also always encourage all of my students to get students, whoo, I'm not a teacher anymore, y'all, not students, clients, um, to give me at least one non-scale victory every single week because those victories are there. Those things are there. They keep us positive. They keep us focused on what's going good, and it keeps us from getting sucked into the trap that the scale isn't doing what you want it to do. It is a trap. It is incredibly negative, and it is something we need to avoid. Um, so, uh, yeah, basically, I, I'm just skimming my notes here. Essentially what I just said, sometimes I go off, uh, off, off, um, script a little bit and then I'm like, oh, I already said that. So what I have here, I said, the scale is a terrible indicator of progress because when she lies to us, we get frustrated, we get discouraged. We need other things to cling to, such as increases in your strength, doing something that you've never done before, someone paying you a compliment, um, a shirt that used to fit and stopped fitting but now it does fit or maybe changing the size when you're going shopping getting a different size in something um, you can do something now that you couldn't do before um, like maybe getting up and down off the floor more easily things like that and then also how do you just feel how do you feel do you feel like you have more energy do you feel like you're able to attack things better all of these are super critical points in your health journey that help you be realistic. When we're expecting too big of a drop in weight, it's likely not going to happen unless you are starving yourself and then you get frustrated, then we think something's not working, we think I'm broken, and then we quit. Okay, it, it's too much, it's too much, I can't deal. So always acknowledge those non-scale victories don't just dismiss them don't just blow them off celebrate that shit y'all we need that we need it okay so review number one how is my sleep number two for real how is my stress number three am i moving enough number four could my body be inflamed and then number five am i setting realistic goals around my weight loss those are the five questions that you need to ask yourself if you are stuck and not losing weight. And remember, stuck means legitimately not losing. If it's a half a pound a week, you are not stuck. Okay, celebrate that, celebrate it. Okay, I've been here way too long. You've been here way too long. Enough's enough. Have a great rest of your week. I will see you Friday when I draw the winner for Free Shit Friday. Get in the group and post using hashtag steps. Whew, I'll see you later. Have a good one.